It's five o'clock in the morning and two hours till the sun rises. Tourists are looking for the best position to view the sunrise at Angkor Wat. The history of Angkor Wat goes back to the 12th century. The tower is shaped like lotus buds at the center of the temple is the symbol of the Angkor Empire and the national symbol of Cambodia. Angkor Wat is the largest religious site in the world. It has a 200 meter wide moat, covers an area of 40,000 square meters, and its perimeter is nearly 6,000 meters long. Angkor Wat is also known as the Temples of Angkor and is the starting point for most tourists looking to explore the Angkor civilization. Over 600 architectural sites stand in the jungle behind Angkor Wat. Together, they form a city which was once the largest in the world. In the 8th century, the Khmer people began building this splendid civilization. They built temples and palaces with sandstone bricks. They expressed their beliefs on these marvelous structures and dedicated them and the empire to their gods. This capital could accommodate one million people. It had both advanced technologies and a unique oriental philosophy and art. But eventually, this splendid city was abandoned to the vast jungle by its builders. As the Angkor civilization declined, these magnificent structures became hidden, collapsed, and decayed. But when explorers discovered them in the 19th century, they still stunned the world. These remains of a civilization hidden in the jungle are a link to a forgotten world, a paradise on Earth. Last year, this 40 square kilometer architectural marvel attracted more than 5 million foreign tourists. A tour through the ruins of Angkor is a journey through jungles and buildings. Visitors have to use the right kind of vehicle. There is no part of this sprawling complex that the tuk-tuk cannot get to. If there is, you need only take another tuk-tuk. Sok is 36 years old. He started working when he was 16. Four years later, he saved enough money to buy his own tuk-tuk. Very happy uh, meeting the customer, everybody at the temple, everybody everywhere. In Cambodia, a tuk-tuk is made up of a two-wheeler connected to a motorcycle in order to carry more passengers. Tuk-tuks are popular all over the world and take on various forms in different countries. The starting fare for a tuk-tuk is one US dollar. Tourists can choose to pay based on the mileage or rent a tuk-tuk and pay by the day. Welcome to Uncle. It's a new jet, very, very nice. Experienced drivers like Sok are deeply trusted by tourists. They know Angkor like the back of their hands. Four face, four face, yes. Uh, Angkor Wat is number one. Beautiful, a wonder, <laughs> temple. Angkor Wat is regarded as the most important of all the temples here. It is a shrine to Vishnu, one of the supreme deities in Hinduism, who is said to have saved the world from danger. The story of Vishnu is carved on the corridors of Angkor Wat. 
on this 49 meters long relief. 92 Devas and 88 Asuras seek the nectar of immortality in an ocean of milk under Vishnu's guidance. They churn the ocean day and night, using Mount Mandara as the staff and the serpent Vasuki as the rope. Vishnu eventually acquires the nectar of immortality, but then the Devas and Asuras begin fighting over the nectar, which finally falls into the hands of the Devas. When a uh, customer to uh, visit the temple, they have the, another time. Sometimes we can uh, sleep at the, on the tuk-tuk. Sometimes we talk with a friend tuk-tuk driver. When tourists keep their drivers waiting outside a temple for a long time, it means this temple is popular. The Bayon is another great temple in Angkor and marks the start of the empire's golden age. The king who ordered its construction was Jayavarman VII and had artisans carve his face on huge rocks. There are 216 carvings of his face on the 54 towers in Bayon. During his reign, he had as many structures built as all his predecessors put together. It was at this time that the Angkor Empire converted from Hinduism to Buddhism, which has since become the most important religion of the Khmer people. This diligent and ambitious king had imposing figures of Khmer warriors carved in a relief that stretches for over 500 meters of the Bayon's periphery. The relief and the faces are a depiction of the cultural and military achievements of Jayavarman VII. You see the balls? They are marked with beads. <laughs> the relief in the Bayon also depicts more than 300 rarely seen scenes of everyday life. In this world-leading city, the Khmer people led a peaceful urban life. Another more precious relief is hidden under an unassuming corridor, which records scenes of construction. Workers are seen moving stones with rope and hoisting them with a machine. At that time, the Khmer people used the most basic tools to build these incredible marvels. And in some other reliefs, trade caravans from China's Yuan Dynasty can be seen. About half a year ago, Sok started to learn Chinese by himself. <laughs> Sok's self-study isn't going very well, but he has a teacher. Six-year-old Chorvin, a talented girl who's been learning Chinese from tourists. <laughs> so we, she is very clever. Oh, he speaks Chinese very, very good. She is a good teacher. <laughs> good, very good teacher. Jorvin teaches Sok for free and only asks for free rides in return. She sells flutes and knows when and where the tourists gather in the largest numbers. She and her friends follow them from one temple to another. Toby's mother and father is die long time. She is lonely. Uh, she is uh, happy every day with the customer, with the tuk-tuk driver. 
look looks me. He oh hello how are you? <laughs> he, she asked me. <laughs> she very clever. Sok has a big family. He has an elder brother and a younger brother. Sok's wife runs a small shop and their son is only a few months old. Sixteen years ago, Sok gave his farm to his younger brother and started his own business as a tuk-tuk driver. Cambodia is a traditional agricultural country, and Angkor is surrounded by farmland. Back then, farmers needed to produce grain for a million people to support this huge city. In tropical regions, there is only a dry season and a rainy season. From May to November, the rainfall can reach 1.5 meters. After six months of heavy rain, farmers welcome the dry season that lasts for half a year. The temperature hovers at around 40 degrees Celsius, and the land becomes dry and barren. The Khmer people showed amazing willpower in the face of these natural challenges. They dug out two huge reservoirs on the plain, East Barre and West Barre. At eight kilometers long and two kilometers wide, West Barre can hold 48 million cubic meters of water, sufficient for irrigation in the dry season. The benefits brought by these giant reservoirs have lasted over 1,000 years to this day. Six kilometers from West Barre, the Khmer people established a new settlement. With a population of slightly over 100,000, the city of Siem Reap has become the gateway to the ruins of Angkor. If the temple represents tourists yearning for the ancient Angkor civilization, then Siem Reap is a link between history and the present. <laughs> Twenty-eight-year-old Sopalo grew up in Siem Reap. During the day, she is a hard-working young girl. At night, she becomes a star. This show is called Smile of Angkor. It portrays the history of the Angkor civilization in the form of a dance drama. The one-hour performance shows how the Khmer people built Angkor and depicts classic Hindu stories. There are about 100 performers in the show, which is in four parts and tells a story spanning 1,000 years. Since 2010, Smile of Angkor has been performed over 2,000 times in Siem Reap. Cambodia's unique Apsara dance is also performed in the show. There are seven dancers on stage, and six of them play maids. The lead dancer in the middle is Sopalo, who plays the role of Apsara. The temples in Angkor were places where the Khmer people worshipped their gods, and the reliefs depict a world of marvels. The most beautiful beings in this world are Apsara fairies born in the ocean of milk. They are the incarnation of clouds and waters, and are reflected vividly in the Apsara dance.
The history of this dance is not a long one. It was created in the mid-20th century by Queen Sisawath Kosamak, the grandmother of the present king. Inspired by Angkor reliefs and traditional Khmer dance, she integrated Khmer history and culture and created the Apsara dance. Today, the Apsara dance has become an essential part of royal celebrations and national festivals. Through the dance, the lavishly attired dancers pray for the nation and the people. Anne Sophia Rita is Sopalo's teacher and used to be a lead dancer. She is a well-known dancer and artist in Cambodia, who is recognized by the royal family. She cultivated Sopalo to become her successor. The competition for a role in the Apsara dance is fierce. Plenty of people give up because they can't take the long hours of practice. So Paolo has stuck to it for 15 years. Since her first show, she has been performing the dance almost every day. She is only 165 centimeters in height, even though the minimum for the height of a lead dancer is 170 centimeters. But thanks to her hard work and efforts, she has become Anne Sophia Rita's best student. Before each performance, Sopalo pays tribute to the previous masters. This is not only a tradition, but also a rule for dancers. The accessories and costumes of previous Apsara dancers are handed down to their successors. As soon as Sopalo puts them on, she becomes the incarnation of Apsara. The Apsara dance involves 4,500 movements. Even the most subtle difference in a movement portrays a different meaning. ตอมาคือปากกาไอ้ชีวิตที่ปีរបស់មនុស្សយើងธรรมดาบัจละอบัจឲ្យบัจនៅบัจទៅ So Paolo's family are all devout Buddhists. She visits the temple every week to pray for her family. Fifteen years ago, she decided to become an Apsara dancer, and her parents saved for years to support her. Apsaras appear on almost all Angkor structures. These elegant and enchanting figures have become one of the hallmarks of Angkor. 
However, even with the protection of fairies and deities, the once powerful Angkor Empire was still unable to escape from the cycle of history. Opinions vary on the causes of the empire's fall, but the general consensus is that it was related to climatic, geographical, and human conditions. But one thing is certain, the jungle that once nourished the empire eventually engulfed it. Tetramelius nudiflora is a large deciduous tree commonly seen in jungles and can produce an immense number of seeds annually. Although few of them grow, those that survive thrive very quickly. A quiet battle has begun between the thousands of sprouts and the millions of stones in the jungle. The most crucial battlefield was Ta Prom, whose walls finally collapsed due to their inability to support the weight of the trunk. This was also the reason why most of the Angkor structures were damaged. However, within Ta Prom, the two parties eventually reached a peace pact. The trunk has now become a natural pillar, protecting and supporting the ancient architecture which has been standing for over 800 years. This delicate balance demonstrates the wonderful coexistence between human, divine, and natural power, and has added to the charm of Angkor's ruins. The engraving of inscriptions, the promotion of Buddhism, the construction of temples, and the irrigation system, Jayavarman VII was the most ambitious king of the Angkor Empire but the institutions he established during his lifetime fell apart instantly after his death. The restoration of the ruins of Angkor was launched as soon as they were discovered, but our exploration of this world cultural heritage has only just begun. <laughs>